stadium. All right. So let's shift now from talking about Houston. Uh, I want to, so, so as part of covering a bunch of different, I want to talk a little bit about um, IQ. And uh, some of you might know, but I, I, had, I discussed IQ in a previous episode, I don't know, a few months ago, uh, about uh, the issue of IQ and race came up. And, uh, and I have to say, whenever the issue of IQ and race comes up, I get pretty angry and pretty pissed off and upset because I, I think uh, tying the two together in any meaningful way, tying to get the two together in any way that has any practical importance, any meaningful value, is, is ridiculous, is, uh, uh, you know, in many cases racist and, uh, and just silly. It's just silly. Because individuals should be judged as individuals. And the question is, is the individual in front of you smart, given the, the role that he has to play and IQ? So one of the things I said during that period is I said that I said something about IQ is irrelevant and an insignificant uh, measure. And it's true. I do believe that in evaluating, I do believe that as a, a measure applied to groups, it is irrelevant meaningless and stupid but i probably misspoke i probably exaggerated the point when applied to individuals because i was so ticked off at the attempt to use iq to in order to further a kind of a, a, a racist agenda uh, yeah i mean iq it turns out has some pretty significant predictive powers over people's performances statistically speaking doesn't mean anything with regard to particularly individuals and their abilities in the future. But in terms of predicting, statistical prediction, IQ is a good predictor of success. High IQ people tend to do better than low IQ people in life, in school, in other things. IQ is a measure of intelligence. It's one measure uh, of a certain type of intelligence. And I, you know, I've done some research on this. I am certainly no expert on this. And, and most of the people talking about these issues are not experts. But um, from what I can tell, from reading the literature, from actually going and reading scientific literature on IQ, I can say a few things. One, IQ is one measure of intelligence. There are others. And there's a big debate in the scientific community in terms of the mind and uh, the, the biology of it, and what we're measuring when we measure IQ, and what is intelligence, and what are the components of intelligence. And there's one article here that says there are five different measures, and IQ is just measuring one. I, you know, I don't know. And my suspicion is, and I'll, I'll get to this when I talk about the evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology topic as well. My, uh, my strong suspicion is, very high probability on this one, no certainty, but a very high probability that we know, we, and I include in the we, scientists and psychologists and people who do the tests and people who evaluate the tests, know very little about the components of intelligence and, uh, and what is biological and what is cultural and what is social and what is hormonal and what is nutritional and all these different components. We know some things. But in the big scheme of things, this is still an area of, uh, of scientific exploration that it's still in its relative infancy. And it's complicated because you're dealing with human beings. You're dealing with a mind. You're dealing with free will. You're dealing with an, the most complex biological thing in the universe, as far as we know, the human brain. And it's dealing with the influences on the individual from culture and society and everything around him on top of the biology, on top of what I think is the most important issue, which is free will. So if you take all those components and then you say, well, free will, uh, it, it, what is it? IQ is 100% genetic. I say BS, nonsense. You don't know that? And there's tons of evidence in the literature, this I've read up on, that that is just not true. So there is, um, and this relates to race stuff, there, is, there are studies of uh, uh, tr uh, tr transracial adoption. 
So white couples adopting a black kid, black couples adopting a white kid. Uh, primarily, it's black kids being adopted by white parents. And IQ goes up significantly because the, based on things like socioeconomics, based on things like education, based on things like the culture that the child is exposed to. So the, it is clearly not. They've done twin studies about this. They, they've, they've, they've taken kids out of certain environments, as I said, and put them in different environments. And you see sharp increases in IQ. There's also the whole question of what is IQ exactly measuring. So the whole issue IQ, while it does statistically correlate with certain outcomes, and is interesting, and I'm sure psychologists can use it, and, and, uh, and, and maybe even can be used in employment decisions and things like that. The idea that we understand what it means completely, or the idea that we understand the relationship between IQ test and intelligence. And what is intelligence? How do you define intelligence? The ability to solve what kind of problems? These are still issues in the science of, of the mind, science of the brain, uh, issues that probably that, that psychology and, uh, or, and, uh, and biologists are going to have a lot to say about, not to mention the, the question of the extent to which free will impacts IQ. And that is, if, and this is pure speculation, this is Euron Brook just speculating off the cuff, right? To what extent does somebody taking ideas seriously, taking knowledge seriously, taking his mind seriously, actually impact his intelligence? Um, and, and all of those factors, taking stuff seriously, all factors of free will, of choices that one makes. My point is that we know very little. <laughs> and we shouldn't pretend to know a lot. And we shouldn't make definitive statements about these things. And uh, particularly if you haven't really studied it and if you aren't really an expert in the field. And I am not. So I'm not going to make definitive statements about this. But let me, let me, uh, so let me say how to measure intelligence. I don't know. The literature seems to be uh, conflicted about this question. And there seems to be a lot of data that suggests that measuring intelligence IQ test is not enough to really measure intelligence. Um, there's a lot of evidence that uh, how you're brought up makes a difference. Culture and, and uh, the, 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 the home environment that you're brought up makes a difference in IQ. Uh, I'm suggesting that free will, whether you engage to the extent that you are focused, plays a role ultimately in the level of your intelligence. Now, I want to relate this to race. So first, I would say this. Um, and I think I said during the show, I don't really care about race. Race is irrelevant, and race, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist, right? So if, uh, you know, I'm just going to use, and, and I differentiate here between race and genes. Genes are really, really important, right, particularly for disease, particularly for uh, certain attributes. Genes are really, really important. Genes are what determine the color of my eyes. Genes uh, have, have determined um, my height, Probably, although nutrition probably plays a role there as well. Uh, that's why human beings have become taller over time as we become richer and, and eaten better. And, uh, you know, genes play a role in my health. It turns out it looks like, again, we know very little, unfortunately, about these things. Uh, it, it, they, they play a big role in health. And um, so I'm not against looking at somebody's genes and, and, and uh, you know, particularly when it comes to health. So s somebody criticized me about how can you say there's no such thing as race when there's certainly genetic differences between people? Yeah, every single individual has genetic differences. And it's true that since some of us share certain genes, we're more likely to have certain diseases. So I share certain genes with a lot of uh, people who identify as Ashkenazi Jews. So when... Um, you know, one of the relevant questions to ask me when I go to the doctor with a stomach ache is, are you an Ashkenazi Jew? Because is, what's the probability you have the genes that cause a particular disease that cause stomach ache? 
it's a bad disease, so you have to deal with it quickly. The fact that I'm saying race is irrelevant, the fact that I'm saying race doesn't really exist, the fact that I'm saying race is, in, 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 in a sense, a construct, it is a construct, that doesn't mean I'm ignoring the fact that we're genetically different and the fact that groups of us have overlapping genomes and that there's value in knowing those overlapping genomes. But you know what? I, I did one of these gene things and, you know, where, where you spit into a tube and they tell you uh, what diseases you're susceptible to. And they also tell you where your heritage is. And on my father's side, I have this Q something g snippet, gene snippet. I don't even know what it means. And this, I share this with people who lived in Siberia a long, long time ago. And it turns out that those people split up and many of them went and crossed the Bering Straits and are now in Latin America and Central America and Northern America, the, the American Indians. So it turns out that based on that, I have a huge amount in common. I have actually more in common with American Indians than I do with Europeans on my father's side. Now, that's all BS, irrelevant to anything. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of cute. And maybe it's relevant to some diseases that might have gone through the genetic code in those snippets. But it's not relevant to anything in anybody's life. It's not relevant to any decision one would ever make about anything. So treating, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, certain groups... Uh, score lower or higher on any particular test, you know, is, is irrelevant as a group. The only thing that matters, and I don't know why you even slice the data based on the group, the only thing that matters is you. Are you qualified to do the job I want you to do? Are you smart enough? Are you productive enough? Are you energetic enough? Are you, you know, good at math enough? Or are you good at verbal stuff enough? Whatever. Whatever it happens to be, do you know the skill set that I need to hire you? That's it. What your color of your skin is, what your genome is, who cares? It's irrelevant. And therefore, race is irrelevant. And the only thing that makes race relevant is people who choose to do so. Right? Who choose to do so. Which means racists, whites, who want to enslave blacks or whites who want to treat blacks as inferior or blacks who want to treat whites as inferior or just want to treat whites badly because they feel like they've been, their ancestors were treating unjustly in the past or whatever. Race should have nothing to do with human decisions and therefore it's irrelevant and any discussion of it, yeah, it's a, what do you call it, a social construct. Call me a lefty, go ahead. Uh, we're going to take a break here, wanna, and then I want to say a few things about evolutionary psychology. Unless there are questions. Didn't Rand say that most people used a small amount of their intelligence anyway? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, people use a small amount of their raw um, biological capabilities whatever the hell that means, and um, that a lot of it has to do with how you apply your mind. And how you apply your mind is a question of free will, not a question of biological determinism, not a question of your racial inclinations, not a question of your race or, 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 it, it's what, or your genes, sorry, or, or, or what you're born with. Free will I, I believe, you know, free will is not caused by your genes. Now, I don't want to get into a huge discussion of free will, but free will is not caused by your genes. It's free will. It, it's initiated by you. That is its essential characteristic, that it's initiated or not. And then you're just cruising in life, following other people, doing what they say or doing what they don't say, but not initiating thought, not initiating your mind your consciousness, to engage with reality. Free will is that engagement. It's that going into focus, choosing to go into focus. And then uh, somebody mentions, and I think absolutely right, that beyond that, 
I think your ability to become, in a sense, more intelligent is dependent on what you do with the tool that you have. That is, to what extent do you integrate your knowledge? To what extent do you use logic? To what extent do you use concepts and definitions and keep concepts clear and, and file them properly in your subconscious, if you will? So to what, all of that, the more efficient you can organize your knowledge, the more intelligent you will be, even if when you were young, you might have scored a lower IQ otherwise. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard, we don't really have the language even to talk about this because all we have is IQ as a measure of intelligence. But I don't believe that that's the only measure of intelligence or the most important intel measure of intelligence, the most comprehensive measure of intelligence. I just think this is still a field in its infancy. But to, to underestimate, the importance of free will, which I think, which we'll get to in a minute as well when we talk about evolutionary psychology, is a massive, massive, massive mistake. And so uh, somebody here says, uh, innate intelligence pales in comparison to rationality. And I agree completely. Rationality, being rational, using logic, engaging, using it, integrating it, you know, it, it, practicing it, practicing uh, living by the objectivist epistemology, by logic is far more important than whatever you were born with. Now, that, that is a very uh, unpopular uh, view. So the whole I, I really want to put to bed the whole issue of race. Forget race. It's irrelevant. And I, I don't know who I'm yelling at here, but hopefully some this I, I'm having an impact on somebody. I have no idea. Uh, uh, all right. I want to switch then to evolutionary psychology now just just to be clear again not a f my field i'm not an expert don't know much about this but i know enough but i know enough to ask the right kind of questions and what i want to do is ask some questions because i know a lot of you for example are fans of uh jordan peterson and fans of other people out there who are who use evolutionary psychology all the time i see it on YouTube videos, I see it on Facebook, I see it on Twitter, I see it everywhere. Everybody just assumes evolutionary psychology as true. I, I watched a video of Steven Pinker debating uh, this woman, and I forget the woman's name, but about the difference between men and women. And again, using kind of the evolutionary psychology, or what I take to be the evolutionary psychology methodology to do that. And... Uh, you know, and I have a lot of questions. So I'm mostly going to be asking questions. I mostly want to suggest to you this idea that this is another one of those fields that is young, new, that we know very little about. And when people come out and say definitive things, oh, men behave this way because they evolved in this way. Uh, I don't know. Uh, men tend to want to have many sexual partners because they're promiscuous, because they generate lots of sperm and they need to distribute that sperm because what's important evolutionarily is having children, right? And, and that drives men to have the inclination to have affairs and to sleep with many women, right? Right? <laughs> I mean, I've heard this. This is, not, this is not unusual. This is a common claim. Women, on the other hand, can only, uh, can only have, uh, you know, one baby at a time. They, uh, they, uh, they are weaker. Therefore, they need to latch on to the one man uh, that impregnates them. They need to keep him around. So they, they, they are much more likely to be monogamous. Women also attracted to wealthy guys because those this is all stuff that comes out of evolutionary psychology some of it's pop evolutionary psychology some of it's real evolutionary psychology whatever that means now what is evolutionary psychology now this is a definition this is from the science daily uh but they but i'm sure there are others uh, evolutionary psychology is a theoretical approach to psychology that attempts so first of all it's in the field of psychology 
that attempts to explain useful mental and psychological traits, useful mental and psychological traits, such as memory, perception, or language, as adaptations, as the functional products of natural selection. So the idea is natural selection has selected certain mental and psychological traits. All right? So I want to ask a simple question. I don't expect, a, I don't expect uh, an answer, but uh, these are the kind of questions I would ask. Let me, uh, Do we understand in psychology, in psychology, that, that's the field that, that does evolutionary psychology, do we have a good understanding in psychology on what are, right, what are traits, capabilities, and behaviors, right? What are they? Does psychology have a good understanding of what perception is? Or do you think you would come to different conclusions about perception if you held different philosophical views within evolutionary psychology? Do the psychologists have good understanding of emotions and where they come from and the relationship between emotions and ideas and thoughts? Do they understand what thoughts are and, you know, the basis for thought? Do they understand the idea of rationality and what rationality is? Do they value reason? Do they believe in free will? And what is the role of free will vis-a-vis -vis whatever psychological traits we might have received through evolution, right. through, through natural selection. So these are the kind of questions I would ask. And I don't think from everything I've read and from all the videos I've watched that there is what I see, in, in, even in the best thinkers, even in the, talk, call it the Jordan Petersons of the world, and, and the Stephen Pinkers of the world, and the woman he debated, is almost no mention of free will, no mention of human reason, no mention of rationality, no mention of, of, of what they mean by traits, what is the border of trait. Do they think, for example, uh, you know, where does, where does uh, and I, you can even go deeper, what is psychology actually studying? Is psychology a science yet? How much knowledge do we have in psychology? Notice that the evolutionary psychologists often ignore cognitive psychology, which from the little I understand, is, is probably most uh, uh, interested in thinking and in ideas and in concepts and the impact that ideas and concepts have on emotions. Right. So, you know, so, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Again, this is not my field. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend to have answers, but I would just say, beware. Beware of, of these definitive answers that they come across. Men are different than women because here's the list. Now, I am convinced unequivocally, without any question, that men are different than women and that there is a biological basis for that. I'm convinced of that, a biological basis and a psychological basis, that men are different than women. How, in what ways in particular, again, above my pay grade, but the very fact that men and women are biologically so different is going to make them different in, other, in the way they relate to reality. The very fact that men and women uh, have, 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 uh, you know, have different biological experiences. Men don't have a menstrual cycle. I think a menstrual cycle has an impact on a woman. Now, what the impact? I don't know. But it's an experience a man will never have. You know, the experience of thinking men and women have the same, right? The experience of, uh, I don't know, hammering a nail into it, the physical experience of, of, of having to walk, of having to think of it. All of those experiences are similar, are the same between men and women. And therefore, I don't think there's any cognitive difference between men and women in that sense. But there are differences. And how they manifest themselves in emotion or in behavior or you know is interesting it's interesting in values and values they seek is interesting the fact that the male penetrates the female is significant it's not irrelevant it can't be irrelevant psychologically 
The fact that for the most part, men rape women, women don't rape men, that is significant. So all of that plays into the differences between men and women. And all of that should, should be studied. Now, there is a legitimate question, and that is, what traits, and I don't even know exactly what traits are, but what traits are genetic? So I can tell you that my two sons were completely different from minute one. In what way were they different? Um, in how, how aware they were of their surroundings, how much sleep, how much they slept, um, you know, whether the, the eye movement, uh, the level in which they engaged with the environment around them, the, the amount of crying. So there are all these things. Now, do we understand those differences? Those are pretty simple. So, those are pretty simple, and, and I don't think we have a full understanding on them. So, I, look, I'm not saying evolutionary psychology is determinism, is deterministic necessarily, although I think many evolutionary psychologists are determinists. But even to f ask the questions of what are traits, what are inherited traits, what are learned habits? Maybe traits are by definition inherited. What are habits? What, a tr what influence do traits have on our cognitive functioning? What influences do our traits have on our emotions, on our habits, on you know, our psychology, on our capabilities, and ultimately on our behavior? I think that evolution psychology is way too uh, dependent on statistics, way too dependent on storytelling, that is uh, making up story, evolutionary stories that explain what they want to explain. They've got a theory, they've got a, and then they go back and they find a story in evolution to explain it. Eh, you know, it's, it's very, very questionable as a science. And, and, you know, Ayn Rand said that in her lifetime, she said psychology was in its infancy. It was just beginning as a science. They were just starting to think about what were the relevant questions. And I think to some extent that is true. I think to some extent that is true. And if that's true, if psychology is still very early, then evolutionary psychology is even earlier. And evolutionary psychology won't be a, a fully fledged science until it has those psychological foundations built until we understand more of what we are talking about. What are the core scientific questions we have to ask? What is psychology? So my suspicion is that much of what you hear in evolutionary psychology is just, is, is, is just not true. It's, 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 it's statistics and correlations and, and, uh, and, and I saw this with Stephen Pinker's presentation. Correlations, a, a correlation is not causality, and they try to attribute causality, and they and they they come up with biological evolutionary stories to to make the causal attribution. But look, I know a little bit about evolution, and I you know, and I've studied some biology, and, and I think most people. Let me rephrase that. I think most intelligent people, I think most intelligent educated people don't really understand biology. Uh, sorry, don't really understand evolution. Evolution is not trivial. What natural selection is, is not trivial. So beware of becoming an amateur psychologist. Beware of becoming an amateur evolutionary psychologist. Because I think the professionals are on shaky ground. I think the amateurs don't know what they're talking about. And I see too many out there way too many amateur evolutionary psychologists. So I'm not saying it's an illegitimate field. I'm just saying it's young, it's new, 
there's a lot of questions to ask, and without the right philosophical framework, it's very difficult to ask the right questions. And since they don't have the right philosophical framework, they're not asking the right questions, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, some people apply this behavior, so it's a little different, um, but they apply evolutionary psychology to finance or to economics. And there's some interesting results there. There's some interesting things that come out when you test large groups and you find that majorities have certain biases. Now, A, that's just a statistic, a statistic that says that some people have a bias. Let's say, um, you know, people um, overestimate risk. They overestimate risk. They don't actually do the math and calculate risk. We're talking about finance where the risk is you can actually estimate it. They get clear probabilities. They get clear decisions, and they tend to overestimate how risky something is. All right, so 65% of people overestimate the risky something is. So what? So is that coded? Is that genetic? Is that inherent in human nature? I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't see how. Can you teach them how to do it? And if you teach them, do they improve? So I once talked to one of these evolutionary psychologists um, who applies this behavioral economics, they applies it to behavioral economics. Uh, he's, he's got an Israeli name, and he's, he's got like 80% of his body's burnt. So I forget his name right now. Uh, a very famous guy. And first of all, the studies he did were complete and utter nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense studies. I could poke holes in those studies all day long. And these are studies that were published in academic literature and were, and, and were published in books and everything. Um, so I would um, – so it, it was terrible. It was just ridiculous, and he came to conclusions without any evidence, without any proof. And then I asked him – I met this guy, and I asked him, okay – when you do this stuff and you discover, I don't know, people have certain biases, people don't, they don't, people don't save for the future because the future is hard to think about. It's far in the future. So people have a tendency not to save. So the conclusion is people inherently biased against the long term and therefore don't save. So we have to force them to save. This is part of the argument that modern liberals and nudge libertarians have for, for, for forcing people to save, right? Because they don't. We, we know. We've studied them. And I asked him, I said, do you discover these things so you can teach people how to be better thinkers? Because then I think it's fine, right? We can discover cognitive errors people tend to make, some people tend to make, and we can teach them how to fix them. Oh, yeah. Dan, Dan Ariely is his name. Dan Ariely. Stay away from the guy. He's awful. Dan Ariely. He is terrible. He is so bad. Anyway, so I asked him. He said, no. There's no point in teaching people how to think. They can't think. They're biased. There's no way to change that. I said, then how, do you, how have you fixed your biases? Why are you not biased? Oh, well, you know, I'm different. I mean, so Plato's philosopher king, it was just unbelievable, right? Uh, he said something like, one of his the theories is that he justifies using this, is that managers have no clue who their good employees and their bad employees are. So when they give people raises, they give people bonuses, it's completely random and it's completely ineffective. And, and there's no real correlation between bonuses and performance because managers don't know. They're not, they can't be objective. They can't think, right? The impossibility of being think, of, of, of actually being rational and objective. And he, and he studies this and he, and he has tests and he shows that people are not this. But when I asked him whether university professors a good at grading their graduate students and deciding who's a good graduate student and who's not and helping them get jobs, the good ones and not helping the bad ones get jobs. Then he said, oh, absolutely. Uh, w w we know how to do that. It's those business people. They, have, they don't have a clue. And, and there's no way to teach them, he added, right? There's no way to teach them. So stay away from Dan Ariely. And, and I'd stay away... I generally would stay away from behavioral psychology unless that's your field, unless you're studying it. It's irrelevant to most things in life uh, unless you're an academic interested in it. Um, I mean, I find some of the arguments kind of interesting. Um, 
and and I but it's it's just amazing to me how much of the stuff online just takes evolutionary psychology for granted, takes these things just as a given, the IQ race thing as a given, and they run with it. And you see it all over the place, including people who are good on things like free speech and good on other things. All right. Well, Molyneux, let me just say about Stefan Molyneux. Molyneux just is, is an utter irra- irrationalist who uses evolutionary psychology, IQ test, anything he can find to justify his racism, his bigotry, his anti-immigration, his political views generally. So he uses pseudoscience to justify politics, which is not a new thing. Uh, uh, authoritarians have always done it. Stephen Molyneux is particularly nasty when it comes to this. He is a real anti-Semite. And, uh, you know, just watch some of his stuff he's done in Israel. And, uh, you know, others, I think, do it more, you know, uh, what do you call it, honestly or, or innocently. Um, you know, I, I, I respect uh, people like uh, God Saad and, and uh, uh, Peterson and, and, uh, and so on. I, you know, I, I think they really, they, they think this is science. And, and partially it's, you know, think about it. Nobody teaches rationality. Nobody teaches reason. Nobody teaches free will, the role of free will, the role of choices. Nobody actually studies the interaction of these things with the traits that we have and the capabilities that we, maybe that we, we are born with. And clearly we're born with something and, and we're born different and men and women are different. But how do you take that and, and, and then take your understanding of reason and rationality and integrate it and come up with new knowledge? I mean, that is hard. Hard, hard, hard stuff. And, all right, uh, do you know of a main trait that evolutionary psychologists point to as positive? Does it fall in with objectivism? I'm not sure what the question, give me an example, because I don't know what the question really asks. What do we mean by a trait, right? What's a trait? And that's a fundamental question, a basic question, right? What is it? Uh, uh, um, now, you know, there's no, I mean, we're different on the outside. There's reason to believe our brains are constructed a little differently, and, and the different construction of a brain is going to have an impact on our capabilities. And I think certainly our capabilities are different. But how that manifests itself, and certainly how that manifests itself psychologically, is a big, big question. Um, some evolutionary psychologists recognize that trade is win-win, but not all of them. I've seen many people who don't. Many people who don't. So again, you know, I'm, I'm reading from comments here, from questions. Don't, don't, you know, you're reading the ones that are more free market. And it's not true that trade is always win-win. Right? It's not true that trade is always win-win. Voluntary trade is not always win-win. I mean, objectivism doesn't hold that voluntary trade is always win-win. I mean, people lose all the time. People voluntarily engage in altruistic behavior that is a losing behavior towards other people all the time. Now, I know that in my talks about capitalism, I talk about win-win in a particular context, in a context of economics. And even there, people sometimes do engage in lose transaction because they, they go buy stuff they can't afford. They go spend money they don't have. They take on debt that is not that, that they don't have. You can't divorce winning in objectivism. You can't uh, 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 divorce winning from being rational. You can't divorce winning from being rational. So to the extent people out there are engaging in economic or other activities and are not rational, uh, they're not win-win relationships. They're voluntary. The preference maximizing in some way, short-term preference maximizing, but they're not necessarily win-win. Now, this is hard, and that's why sometimes even I, in my talks, fall back on, well, trade is win-win. Not always. Rational trade is win-win. When rational people trade, it's win-win. That's the way to think about it. You cannot, uh, libertarians tend to think, that any human activity is selfish, self-interested because a human en engaged in it. And that, therefore, we're all selfish. 
because everything we do is in our own interest. That's just not true. And that's a whole other topic we'll talk about another time. All right, psycho psychological traits like maybe loving your family more, having less empathy for enemies. I, don't, I can't imagine that either one of those is evolutionary, is, has anything to do with evolution and has anything to do with biology. I might be wrong, but I don't think they have. I think these have to do with the values. They're chosen. They have to do with the choices you make. They have to do with what, how, how you grow up, the, the, you know, the, the kind of decisions you make based on the experiences that you have while you are growing up. But I don't think a baby is born loving or not loving, or a baby is born with more empathy or less empathy. I, I, you know, I don't think that's true. Right? Came in developed through kin, those through kin selection. How do you know that? Is that how biology works? Is that how evolution works? And once you have, once you have a human consciousness with free will, does evolution still work the same way? So once human beings can make choices, does evolution work the same way? Does it code into us? Instincts, in a sense. And Ayn Rand said no. Ayn Rand argued that at least that ideas cannot be coded into us. That, and since our emotions are a product of our ideas, then how much we love X is not coded into us. It's a product of an idea. It's a product of a choice. It's a product of a decision we made. No, but it's not clear. And it's not clear to me that cavemen followed a general altruistic ethos. I don't believe, I don't know that that's true. I don't know that um, that they did it because it was evolutionarily helpful to them. I mean, imagine if you're if you're a tribe in a cave, you're living in caves, right? And suddenly somebody comes up with the idea of individualism, and hey, we should all be selfish, and we should all allow the human mind to flourish, and we should all be thinking. And when somebody creates something new, we shouldn't. We shouldn't beat him up. We should celebrate him. Would they have a competitive advantage versus other tribes and other caves that don't have that attitude? I mean, the idea that altruism is a survival benefit to human beings with a rational mind is nuts. It's nuts. And it's nuts in a cave. It's nuts in a clan. It's nuts in agricultural society. And it's nuts today. Sorry. It doesn't work. You can't code in moral ideas. We're not coded with altruism. So what does Ayn Rand say? Ayn, Ayn Rand believes in tabula rasa. We're born tabula rasa. What does that mean? Again, what does that mean? In, in, I'm not sure what it means. But it certainly means we have no ideas. We don't inherit in our genes any ideas. What do we inherit in our genes? Because clearly we're different genetically. I don't know. And I doubt any of you do either. And I'm curious when the first real objectivist intellectual thinker who studied the philosophy, who understands reason, understands objectivist epistemology deeply, when that person goes into evolutionary psychology I, or, or psychology, I think he'll have really interesting things to say about these issues. I'm not that person, so I'm not going to have interesting things to say other than to question what you're saying because I think a lot of you, a lot of people out there, don't know what they're talking about. Don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, free will changes everything. Human consciousness, human consciousness changes everything, including how we evolve, including what evolution means. I think evolution means... Here I'm really going off, uh, off on a limb. I think evolution means something very different when it comes to human beings. And I suspect that once you introduce free will and once you introduce the kind of conceptual consciousness that human beings have, that evolution stops working, at least stops working in the conventional sense. So... Um, 
I mean, what I encourage you, those of you interested in these topics, think about it. But before you go jump in evolutionary psychology and into the mumbo jumbo there, go really study the objectivist epistemology. Really get to understand it. Really get to understand what Ayn Rand means by tabula rasa, what she means by ideas, where emotions actually come from. And introspect. Yeah, so somebody says here, reason disconnected us from evolution. Yeah, I think that's right. I think reason disconnects us from evolution in, in, a, in a really, really significant way. Now, is that everything there is to say about the topic? I doubt it. But so evolutionary psychology, you know, maybe it's probably, it's probably mis, a misnomer. The real question is when evolutionary transition from an animal consciousness to what is a modern human's consciousness, when that transitioned 100,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, I don't know. What happened? What happened biologically? And then what happened psychologically? And, and, and what is left biologically in terms of traits and things like that? All right. Um, somebody's asking about the school of uh, psychology that Gina Golan practices. I think practiced by Gina I think it's called cognitive psychology. But you'd have to check with her. I think it's cognitive psychology, which is very different. Which, which places at the center the role of ideas. Right. All right, I want to make this last point, and we're not going to have, a lot, we're not going to have time for questions, so we're, we're going to have to do a session just on questions because it turns out that even on topics I know very little about and have very little to say on, I, I say a lot of stuff. Um, all right, <laughs> and that might be a vice, not a virtue, I'm not sure. Some of you will let me know, I'm sure. 